I want to just say how happy I am to be with you all this evening. It's uh, been a pleasure to come here. I certainly want to thank everyone involved in setting up my visit. For those of you who've tried to schedule lectures, you know that there's an extraordinary amount of work that goes into it. So I want to start with Dr. Carlos Hill, who really um, helped bring this topic, I think, to, to your attention, and then also um, Dr. Stephen Balch, and then Dr. Catherine Galley for all of the work that they put in. And I think it's a particular art to be able to make someone feel so welcome, and so I really want to say thank you for that. Um, if you're too nice to people, they end up not leaving. And when I found out tomorrow is Buddy Holly's birthday, then it's going to be a, a tough call. So, um, so I really want to thank you all. This has just been a really wonderful moment. Um, I also want to thank uh, the Institute itself for the study of Western civilization, and also, once again, the Department of Classical and Modern Languages and Literatures for their support of this event. I'm really pleased to welcome my colleagues in classics as well as the broader audience. Um, I'm especially thrilled to be part of such an exciting lecture series, a very impressive series, that's going to set out to explore the history of Western civilization and try to probe some of its meaning in the modern world. So the fact that this work today is included in that is extremely gratifying to me, and I hope that I will get you all started on your year-long exploration uh, in the most productive way possible. So I want to start with this, which is the book that uh, Dr. Hill talked about. Um, I hope it doesn't seem like shameless promotion. It's still always kind of a thrill to me to have it be a thing. It's something that I thought a lot about for many, many years. And so when it suddenly appeared as an object in my office mailbox, it, mailbox, it was extremely exciting. And it's really uh, the basis then for what I'm going to talk about here. So I wanted to just say a few words about the book itself and then really get into the particular piece I wanted to look at tonight. So my work on the idea of race in antiquity uh, spanned a lot of years, actually. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, a lot of time thinking about how to write about this topic. That's in many ways just as hard as trying to figure out what I think is how to communicate that. But it actually started with a really, a pretty simple question. And the question it started with was why don't we, and by we I meant ancient historians, why don't we talk about race anymore? And I really wanted to know why. Why is it that when you pick up scholarship about the ancient world, you are no longer seeing the term race? And um, it's not that classical historians haven't thought about collective identity. It's not that they haven't thought about difference. They have long acknowledged the importance of the ways that the Greeks and Romans defined themselves and tried to think about how they did it and what those consequences were. But the terminology of race itself had dropped out. And so that's what I really wanted to think about. Why? Why aren't we calling... Uh, some of these dynamics race. So I'll spare you some of the details of my examination of this. A lot of it is sort of navel-gazing about the field of classics itself, which is interesting to some and not at all interesting to others. Um, but suffice to say that there were a series of turns in the field of classical studies itself that really culminated with the first volume of Martin Bernal's Black Athena and the heated debates that followed from that work in the 1980s. And so there was this moment where there was a lot of talk about race in classics. Um, but then it dropped out. I think because of the kind of intensity of the debate, classicists simply stopped using the terminology and began to use really almost exclusively terminology like ethnicity and cultural identity. So when they started to name collective identity, they called it that instead. And I don't want to diminish the importance of those terms. In many contexts, they are extremely enlightening and very helpful to understanding antiquity. But I came to believe that there was also a problematic turn that had happened, that by avoiding race, um, something was really missing from what it is that we do. Um, and I was also really became convinced that a lot of classical historians simply misunderstood the term race. And so we're avoiding it out of this preconception of what it was, rather than really thinking about it in more complicated terms. So there was a kind of suspicious turn that I wanted to investigate. So the main thrust of this book is really to make the argument that the terminology, that the concept of race was absolutely essential to the ancient world, and that we needed to start using it again. We needed to talk about it under that term. But, and this is a really critical second part of the book, that we really needed to determine what race actually meant in antiquity. So we need to use the word, but we also need to figure out what it means and how we can actually employ it. And that means also then looking at the consequences of racial thinking and the consequences of race as an idea. 
And so when I talk about race, um, and I can certainly fill more of this in, but let me just give you a, nothing is simple about race, but the, the general way that I approach race is as a kind of framework. It's a way in which we organize ideas about human variation. So how is it that we think about, and I should add perceived human variation, how is it that we think about the differences that we think we perceive in the world? How do we organize our ideas about that? Um, how do we classify people then according to that? So that was my main way of thinking about race, uh, is to wonder how it was that in antiquity people classified human variation, um, how they thought about difference. And in that sense, um, the model that I use is one of race as a process. I call it a formation. I'm not the first one. I'm using other people's terminology. But in that sense, you want to think about race not as a simple fact, but as an act, something that is in motion, something that is a process. Another way to think about it is a verb rather than a noun. And that's really what I wanted to start um, wondering about, not just the sort of passive thing that we might find in antiquity, but this whole set of operations that happen in thinking about difference, how to think about it, how to impose your thoughts on other groups of people, how to live your life according to those thoughts, um, so how to impose race, how to live race, all of that was what I was trying to get at in the study of antiquity. And another way of thinking about that um, particular um, contrast is to think about the role of what we might call racial categories. So how it is that we impose racial ideas on other people. But that's very different from the idea of a racial identity, which is something that individuals might perform on their own terms. So we might think of race as a kind of interaction of external perceptions and internal performances. So what we think about ourselves, but also the way that other people categorize us and respond to us. Okay, so that's my general idea of what I wanted to find, or not see if I could find in antiquity, this idea of thinking about human variation and what uh, consequences it might have. And there are all sorts of ways that you could do this. We could reconstruct race or racial ideas, racial frameworks, in antiquity by reading philosophical works, by reading uh, different kinds of works, but it seems particularly productive to look at specific case studies. So to find moments where it looks like the Greeks or Romans are thinking racially, they're acting racially, they're performing racially. And um, where these frameworks then are asserted, performed, um, undermined, that's another really important idea of race. So I wanted to think about race, but I really wanted to, in the book, pursue a series of case studies. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. I'm not going to talk to you really any more about the philosophical or theoretical underpinnings of the project and really focus on a very specific case study, which is the Egyptian queen Cleopatra. So we're going to talk about her today. And as my title suggests, I want to claim Cleopatra in the sense of arguing that she can illustrate for us some of the operations of ancient notions of race. And there are two ways that she can do that. One is that she can provide the grounds for a deeper understanding of race. If we really look at her, we can learn certain things about this idea of race as a process, not just a fact. But the other thing that she helps us do is to really shed light on the misconceptions that have plagued notions of ancient race um, and have really created this enormous fog around her in particular. So before I talk about what we might know about her in antiquity, I want to talk a little bit about this fog that surrounds her and how it was produced, um, how it's been reproduced, and how we might get around it. Okay, so that's the kind of goal, is to think about why it is that we have certain ways of thinking about her, but to get rid of that fog to try to get back to a different way. So we want to turn then to the woman who brought you all here tonight. I have no illusion that it is me. And this is Cleopatra, the Queen of Egypt. So um, since Cleopatra's death by her own hand in 30 BCE and um, a suicide, an act of self-destruction that was perhaps performed with the aid of asps, uh, she has fascinated centuries of audiences, especially in the West. Without question, Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra provides a major lens for our Western encounter with Cleopatra. And um, that play first appeared in print in 1623. So we're going to kind of move forward from um, the 1600s on in thinking about her meaning in the West. And I'm going to focus today particularly on art because I think it's a little bit more interesting in this lecture format to look at um, representations of Cleopatra, to try to develop a kind of visual literacy of Cleopatra, what is happening in, in certain images of her, 
But you could apply what we're going to do visually to all sorts of written texts from the same period. I'll, I'll give you a few examples, but I really just want to focus on art. The other thing that I really want to talk about first in relation to um, this visual tradition of Cleopatra is this notion of the gaze. This is a notion that has really emerged out of feminist uh, scholarship. And it raises the question in forms of narrative, who is being looked at? Who is doing the looking? What is the scope of our vision in various ways? And this is um, a still from Cecil B. DeMille's, uh, excuse me, no, it's um, Elizabeth Taylor as Cleopatra somewhat later. Um, but you can see, even in this movie still, that Cleopatra is being framed in a very particular way. We are encouraged by the ways that the figures are posed. You have these figures sort of supporting our gaze up at her. And then certainly the most prominent gaze in this entire still is that of the Sphinx itself, who is looking directly at us. So there's all sorts of ways that this image, and certainly the movie itself, is playing with vision. Where do we look? What do we make of our look at Cleopatra? And um, it's a way then of kind of thinking about power, of putting power together, and then trying to distribute it between people or figures in the image, and then also the viewer, him or herself. So that's really what I want to start with, is how is it that we can think about the gaze when it comes to Cleopatra? Okay, when we think about um, the gaze and Cleopatra, uh, we're generally invited to look on her in ways that emphasize her sexual difference. And this is a slightly later image. We'll come back to a lot more. There's a lot more noise in this image. But generally speaking, when we were first invited to look, when we were first invited to look at Cleopatra in the 16th, 17th centuries, what was most distinct was this idea of her femininity, the fact that she was female. And so we were invited to look at her body. And her body was presented to us as a kind of object of consumption. And I'll show you a few images of that for sure. But I want to make an interesting uh, point, which is that our impulse for looking at Cleopatra is something that we often try to ground in antiquity itself. And so one of the stories that's told about Cleopatra is about her first encounter with Julius Caesar. And as the story goes, Cleopatra hid herself in a carpet. The carpet was taken before Julius Caesar, and then she jumps out at this opportune moment. And this is a much later painting of that, but you can see that this painter is relying on this idea of her suddenly coming into vision. And she's being presented through the lighting of the painting as the complete object of our gaze. Also of Caesar's over here. He's doing this because he's supposed to be surprised. Um, but you can see that we're really focused on her body, which has a certain transparency, a certain nudity. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more later about the skin color of this uh, portrait. Uh, but this is really what was what we're going to see reproduced in some of these earlier images. This idea that we should look at her, consume her as this female object. Um, this um, is a painting that we're going to go back a little earlier in time, but we're going to come back and talk a little bit more of some of the other elements that surround her. And I'll just point you to this figure here, which is going to be a kind of interesting, we'll come back to why we have this male figure maybe flanking her clearly less powerful than her, although Caesar is really at her same eye level, so he's not cowering before her. But then also this enormous space that she occupies. And we'll come and talk more about this, how this setting for Cleopatra um, comes out in the visual tradition. Okay, but for now, I really want to focus on this idea, this tradition of us being invited to look at her in Western art. Okay. So these are really then, we're going to start then uh, in the 17th century. And these are pretty typical representations of her. You can see we no longer have this um, very elaborate background for her. Uh, we do have the asps. So not only is her body often partially naked, but it's also being penetrated often by these snakes. So we're consuming her with our eyes. They are literally consuming her. Um, and you can see here is the asp there. This picture on the right, um, to me, is a really amazing picture because it really reinforces this idea that what we should be doing at Cleopatra is looking at her. Because not only are we looking at her, but she's got all of these other women looking at her and this death um, that she's in. And I should uh, underline that many of these images that we're going to look at from this period focus on the moment of her death. So that's when we consume her, as she is herself being consumed, uh, perhaps, by asps. Okay, um, 
Let's see. The other thing that I want to just call attention to here is you want to notice in this tradition of her images whether or not she's surrounded by men or women. It's a kind of interesting question. You see here that she's surrounded by presumably, I think, her serving women or her maids. Uh, but this is a, an entirely female scene. And they, too, are also um, making their body available to us. Okay, and, and I'll just emphasize that now we have a Cleopatra who is quite pale. That's part of what we're being asked to look at, the paleness of her body. Okay, and two, uh, and when we think of Cleopatra not just as this female body in death, but as a queen who is negotiating power with the Romans um, at the time of her death, I'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, we tend to get scenes that focus on the sameness of Cleopatra with her Roman conquerors. So this is Cleopatra um, looking very much of the same, if you want to say, cultural background as Octavian. The setting is extremely Roman. There's even this Roman statue in the background. So there's not there an attempt to imagine Egypt, um, which is a kind of hint at what's coming later. Um, and then also uh, a much more loaded scene where she is actually offering herself physically in surrender to Octavian. But her clothing does not look particularly unlike Caesars. You wouldn't know from looking at this um, that they are racially different, ethnically different, that she is Egyptian, all of those things that we'll talk about more. Okay, what is important about these scenes then is not this sense that she is culturally different, but that she is sexually different. So it's really the gender, the sexual difference that these early painters focused on, this idea of Cleopatra as a woman. And along with that, we can kind of problematize the role of the gaze in thinking about Cleopatra and her sexual difference, because alongside some of these other traditions, you have increasing experimentation with Cleopatra's own gaze. And we first see this, this is quite an early, this is an incredible image from Michelangelo, where you see that our look at her is deflected because she's looking away. So the kind of vision line of the painting is distracted for us, because she's not just offering herself, she's actually looking in another direction. Okay, so she's kind of, she's disrupting the gaze here by looking away. Uh, this uh, painting much later, we also get a Cleopatra who is still, she's kind of caught between modes here. She's still offering herself to us physically, so we have all this attention on this pale, vulnerable female body, but she's also looking up. So she's also, in a way, disrupting what it is that we might be seeing. So we're looking, but then we are um, with the vision line also being encouraged to look up with her. And notice, we'll come again back to this, but she's now started to get a little bit more of a setting, a little bit more of a surrounding. You can see now some kind of leopard skin um, that's trying to identify her. Okay. I want to um, just give special attention in this idea of Cleopatra's gaze to a very compelling piece um, by Edmonia Lewis. And Edmonia Lewis was an African-American and Native American sculptor who spent much of her life in Italy. And in 1873, she became one of the first um, internationally renowned female sculptors to exhibit at a very important exhibition um, where she presented a bust of Abraham Lincoln. So she was doing art very much of the time. This piece, um, she uh, created the death of Cleopatra. This, like many other images we've been looking at, shows Cleopatra at the moment, maybe right after her death or in death. She has a little bit of this tradition of displaying her body to us, but notice how fully um, her vision is deflected here. She is really turned away from us, and there's something going on where we can't possess her in the same way because she's not really um, letting us or holding our attention. She's not holding our eyes. Um, if you um, look at this image online and you look at it from the side, I don't have a picture of that, but it's a really interesting effect, a very different effect. She's actually got a, re a very peaceful and almost blissful look on her face. It's a really incredible piece. Um, this piece was evidently lost for many, many years, and it turned up, let's see if I have the year right, in 1988 on the grave of a racehorse named Cleopatra. Um, so that entire history... Hopefully someone has unpacked it. But this piece is now in the Smithsonian National Museum of American Art. So you can go and um, see that in person. Okay, we're still thinking then about this idea of now we're moving into the 19th century, um, coming into this greater questioning of how to look at Cleopatra and how it is that she looks. And we get this really forceful representation of her. She is kind of sitting back, but she's really not consumable in this. This is not a queen for the taking. 
as it were, and she's looking back very assertively, not making eye contact uh, with us, but certainly there's now a sense of her own power and defiance. And uh, there's very clearly a crown on her head, so this idea, we didn't see that in some of the earlier uh, portrayals, that she is a queen. So starting to think about her in those ways. The notion of Cleopatra's gaze becomes even more explored, even more prominent in the 20th century. Um, this is a very famous early um, film version of it and with Theta Bara and all of the images that you see of her in the costume of Cleopatra, she is looking straight at the camera. Um, and it's understood to be a kind of sexual challenge that now she's become a kind of Medusa figure, a sort of castrating force. So her sexuality is no longer a kind of passive offering that she makes, but now it's a kind of challenge that she has. And so we can see then into the 20th century more of this questioning, where should Cleopatra look? How should we look at her? Um, and this is not the main movie poster for this uh, Cecil B. DeMille's production, but I found it and I thought it was incredible because you have this disembodied floating head and really a huge amount of attention on her eyes, on the way that she looks. And I also want to point out to you these male figures that flank her because we want to come back to that question. Why is she being surrounded? by figures who are very clearly black. So what's going on here with thinking about her um, in this 20th century? Um, but if we follow this idea of the gaze a little bit further through, um, we can see a growing discomfort uh, with it. And so very famously, in, uh, the Cleop in the Elizabeth Taylor Cleopatra, we have all this pomp and circumstance and potential power around Cleopatra, but just when it looks like she's a force to be reckoned with, she winks. And it's this sort of moment of camp that gives back the gaze, that sort of makes fun of the power of her eyesight. Um, and so the, the, I think the movie there is kind of a little bit um, afraid of what it might be doing with her looking. Um, and I think that's a kind of sort of self-sacrifice that this Cleopatra makes. Just when she should be taking power, she sort of makes fun of it in this very, very campy moment. And there's a lot about this movie that's campy, but that in particular uh, is camp. Um, and this idea then of, of Cleopatra's looking, I think, has um, a continuing resonance in some very recent images of Cleopatra. One is the image that was chosen for the recent National Geographic exhibit in which she is all eyeball. I mean, this is what we get. This is Cleopatra's eye. Um, so this idea that, that eyesight vision should be how we look at her has become the central motif, along with the snake, because we can't resist the snake. Um, so that, I think, is really important. But it's not looking directly at the viewer. Uh, but it's a really, I think, a fascinating image to take in promoting her. And then the other thing that you may or may not have seen is a very uh, famous recent biography of Cleopatra. And you see that the cover art of this, she is completely turned away. So we can't, even if we wanted to, make eye contact with her. So this is also really avoided this idea of where she might be looking. Okay, so all of these I'm trying to suggest are parts of the tradition of Cleopatra that center around her gender, her sexual difference, a little bit around her political power. What would it mean for a woman to hold power? What is a queen, in other words? Um, but beginning in the 18th and 19th centuries, there's also going to be greater and greater interest and fascination with what it means that she is an Egyptian queen. So now we're going to see artwork and representations of her that try to figure that out. How would we show her as Egyptian? Not just female, not just powerful, but what does Egyptian mean when it comes to Cleopatra? And there are two trends in the 18th and 19th century that really help foster this particular look at her Egyptianness. The first is, and this is something I write about um, quite a bit in the book, I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but I'm happy to take more questions. The first thing that really is, is important in understanding this is the rise of new theories about race itself in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, so there's a whole new way of thinking about race, of understanding race, trying to make it into a kind of scientific discourse to try to naturalize this process of human variation, to say that it comes from a natural source, which for 18th and 19th century thinkers was the human body itself. And so in the 18th and 19th centuries, we start to have this idea that race can be located on the surface of the body, that it can be correlated with skin color. Okay, this is only an 18th, really a 19th century. Um, it's not quite an invention, but it certainly becomes really systematized there. So to think about Cleopatra as Egyptian is going to involve now greater questions about her skin color. 
The also, also thing that we have during this time is the rise of interest in Egypt itself, a kind of Egyptomania that draws on the allure of Egypt's position in the so-called Orient. And those of you who know Edward Said's work, Orientalism, this is really what he's talking about there, what happens during this time that makes the Orient such a fascination and becomes a way for the West to define itself against something. So um, as you will see very shortly, Cleopatra is going to become really immersed in this Orientalism, this idea of what um, the East looks like and how we should produce and reproduce um, its, uh, it visually. Now, the one thing that I do want to say is that Egyptian ruins had long been visible to uh, Western travelers, and the Greeks and Romans were themselves fascinated by the pyramids. They knew Egypt in certain material ways, but we see a particular acceleration of interest, of knowledge about Egypt in the Western world, beginning with Napoleon and his time in Egypt in 1798 to 1801. So this is what I'm thinking about, this very particular interest in Egypt that becomes uh, progressively um, intense. And so what we see then between, and really this is more about Orientalism first, I'll come back to race, we can see then throughout the um, 18th, 19th centuries, a growing change in how to show Cleopatra by what we should put around her. How can we signify Cleopatra as Egyptian? And what you're going to see then is a whole new set of Victorian conventions that define that. So she's going to start to wear very particular clothing. She's going to start to have very particular interiors that she functions in. Her space is going to be coded as Egyptian for us. Um, and as are some exteriors, we're going to see her outside as well. So we're going to start to see now not just herself, but this larger sense of where she is, how she operates, what it means to be Egyptian. And these then are some of the images. Um, so you could go back to the one of her jumping out in front of Caesar. But I thought this makes a nice contrast. If we look at this, this is Cleopatra's death. This is the earlier image. Um, this is a really interesting one by a, a female painter. But in any event, it follows this convention. She's naked. There's nothing particularly, um, I guess, remarkable about her clothing, except that it's not really covering her. Um, but we get a very much a close-up view. We're not um, interested in what it is that surrounds her as defining her. Once we get into this very Victorian interest in Egypt, you start to get this enormous sort of apparatus around her, all of these things that code her as Egyptian, from the colors to what it might look like to be in an Egyptian temple. Um, so this is her death. She still is visible to us, but now she's got her headdress. Now she is coded as Egyptian in very, very particular ways. So the same moment, but this is clearly much more immersed in thinking about Egypt and its Orientalism, um, what it would mean to show Egypt. Um, okay, uh, let's look at a few more of these then. So this is in that similar model. We see here much more attention to the couch that she's lying on. Um, you can see some of the colors, some of the headdress. Um, so she's still um, consumable. She's still laying out. She's still vulnerable in the way that she's shown, but she's now placed in a very particular environment. This is also another very interesting um, image of her. So now she has not only leopard skin, but an actual leopard next to her. And she's doing something here that's understood to be very barbaric. Um, and this also sort of comes out of Roman depictions of her, that her exoticness, her Orientalism, is also about the threat to other people. And so here you have these sort of very um, sedate female bodies, and you have all these male bodies then writhing in agony, because according to the title of the painting, she's been uh, testing poisons on them. Um, something that is obviously a very exotic thing and not a particularly nice thing to do. Okay, and I, I do want to say that some of this is not entirely invented, and, and there are people who've done a lot of really interesting work on the Victorian view of Egypt. Because some of it, if you went to Egypt, might look kind of familiar to you, although it's been filled in by fanciful reconstructions. But it's an attempt to sort of um, systematize or make into a code what people were seeing. So it becomes this kind of shorthand for Egypt. And you will see, incidentally, these same kind of shorthands in 20th century film. Oh, if she's inside and I want to show Egypt, this is what I'm going to use. It's going to go back to the same sort of visual vocabulary is a way to think of it. Um, and we're going to see that Cleopatra herself is going to use uh, pharaonic visual vocabulary. So it's, it's a really complicated idea here. But this is, I want to suggest to you, something that's really prominent in the Victorian period. And I want to just make a, a short um, digression to say that if any of you have seen HBO's Rome, um, they attempt in that um, program, 
it's a much longer conversation, everything they attempt to do. But one of the things I think that's really striking if you watch it is that they make her court, which is the Ptolemaic court, really visually strange. It doesn't look like this. It really disrupts what we think of Egypt. And I think that that's a conscious decision on their part to really challenge what it is um, that makes her Egyptian in this later period. So I have one picture of Cleopatra from that program. But there's a really excellent um, uh, article about that where someone talks about the disorientation of it. And I think that's the perfect way. We've been accustomed to this as Egypt. We're very comfortable with this. But HBO's Rome throws at us something that is actually kind of disorienting. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's actually a really interesting decision um, to me. OK, but there's no question that this kind of Egyptomania and this interest in Egypt really then flourished with the opening of King Tut's tomb. And so this happens in 1922. It's really a mass media event. And then you start having the consumption of ancient Egypt that's being facilitated in even broader audiences. Um, and this is where you're really going to get um, an increase in thinking about Egypt and the appropriation of Egypt and what it's doing in the West. And you can see then, in particular, or one train we can follow it, is the use of Egyptian motifs in the Art Deco movement. So the Art Deco movement really um, emerges shortly after the discovery and is going to be completely interested in creating this systemization of Egypt. And it's a really complicated gesture. It's both about appropriating Egypt, but also continuing to keep it exotic and somehow different um, from the West. And these are just some examples of that. Um, there were all sorts of Egyptian theaters that emerged that were supposed to kind of uh, mimic um, Egyptian uh, temples. You have this very stylized version here with this allusion to temples in the background. And then these individual items like the papyrus or like the lotus that you will see again and again um, in very, very stylized ways as a kind of, again, a kind of shorthand or footnote to remind you that you're looking at Egypt. And this is, I think, a really incredible image. This is um, an Art Deco rendering of Cleopatra herself. Um, she's extremely stylized in this portrait. Notice here her gaze has become one of narcissism, so now she's looking at herself in a mirror. But you can see this, um, sorry, this um, papyrus that she's holding. So all of these um, ideas, now she's got this whole way of performing Egyptian for us, a way that is becoming progressively legible to us in the West because of these images we're being fed. OK, so that's the sort of Egyptomania, if you want to call it that. That's the fascination with Egypt, how Egypt as a kind of commodity has been packaged for us in the 18th and 19th centuries. But I want to go back to that question about race and how race is contributing to our interest in Cleopatra and the questions that were being asked. So as all of this is happening with Egypt and trying to determine ways of looking at Egypt, there was also, as I suggested, a growing attempt in the 19th century to think about race as a science. Um, and it connected notions of difference to biology. And the idea was that it was a natural phenomenon. Race was somehow passively recorded for us in our bodies. And it took then as the supreme sign of race, skin color. And this is really where you see the growth of all of this attention to different racial categories that were being defined by the human body. Um, there are a few things that I want to just say about this it's really a complicated topic, but the, some of the things that we might note, along with this new approach to race as a biological idea, scientific pseudoscience idea really, was also a really important turn for what's called monogenesis to polygenesis. Um, and the idea of monogenesis really came from the Bible, and the idea was that all human beings had a single source, that's the idea of the mono. Okay, that we all came from the same uh, source, and therefore human variation occurred later on in our evolution. I shouldn't say evolution, that's not a very popular word at that time, but in our development. So human difference developed later than human origin. When this scientific theory of race came into vogue, it shifted that really dramatically to say that human beings had multiple origins. So from the very origin, we were different from one another. And you can see that that's a much more categorical way to think about things. Not that humans develop differently, but that we were different from the very beginning. And that's going to have really powerful impact on how people think about race and difference. The other thing that's sort of a subtext in all of this is this scientific approach to race does not emerge um, neutrally, but it emerges precisely to allow certain claims of superiority. So I can say, I can say that races are different naturally. 
And naturally, some races are better than others. And that's precisely the claims that were being made. So it wasn't that um, it was me saying that. It was nature saying that. Um, and we still really have a hangover from all of that, and we still struggle to try to make sense of that idea. And what's really interesting for the purposes of this lecture is that ancient Egyptians actually played a really prominent role in some of the debates around these theories. And they were subjected to intense scrutiny within this new model of what race they had been. So imposed onto ancient Egyptian bodies was this precise question. What skin color had ancient Egyptians had? Where did they stand at this moment of multiple origin? Um, and in some ways, there's a very um, insidious project in this, which is the problem that some 19th century thinkers had with understanding how Egypt had been able to have such an impressive civilization. So the question they, they really were trying to think around was, or, or to prove in essence, was that Egyptians had been white because they had been able to build pyramids, because they had had such an impressive um, social structure and had been so impressive historically. So what you have in the 19th century then are a series of anthropologists who go to Egypt, dig up Egyptian skulls to demonstrate that these Egyptian skulls prove that the Egyptians were white. And this becomes a really central project to these scientific theories. And so this is really the famous, uh, I just took an image from it, but uh, George Morton was really the famous person for doing that. He goes and he does this extremely, quote unquote, scientific study of skulls to prove that the Egyptians were white. This work is then taken up by these other two people, um, J.C. Knott and um, George Glidden. Um, and they wanted then to think even more and use this as a way of thinking about hierarchy. So they ac accepted full stop that the Egy ancient Egyptians had been white. And they started to do even more sort of subtle thing, maybe not so subtle, but um, ideas. So when they found variation in skulls in Egypt, what they argued was that, yes, the ancient Egyptians had been white, but when I find skulls that don't look white, those were actually slaves. They didn't come from Egypt. So Egyptians are white. Egyptians had slaves who were black. And what it turned out to then try to do was to provide, to provide a justification for American slavery. Because what they found through these skulls was an ancient society where white people had enslaved black people. And it was this, I mean, it seems incredible, at least to me today, that that was to them scientific. Okay, so here's my category. Egyptians are white. When I don't find that, oh, that must be the black slaves. Um, so nothing really set them off. And this is um, this very famous, then, um, image or hierarchy of um, the types of mankind. So this really demonstrates that the idea of scientific race and difference was not neutral. They were doing it to produce superiority versus inferiority. And the thing I really want to say is this is not a person. This is a statue. So their ideal white person is Apollo. Um, so I just, you know, and I think it would have been unremarkable to readers of that time that um, a marble statue would stand as the epitome of the um, superiority of whiteness. And so this question then of Egyptian blackness um, has all of these subtexts in it, which is why I continue to think it's a really important question. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that um, at the end of the talk. But I, I don't dismiss this question, even though I'm going to explain to you why I don't like the grounds of the question, but it's a question that has all of this investment in it um, coming out of this 19th century. And so we can see then some of this real intensity about race, about Egyptian blackness, beginning then to percolate into um, portrayals of Cleopatra into the 20th century. And I'll fast forward here. You could do a lot more with images along the way. But this is one way of thinking about uh, Claudette Colbert and then also these uh, people who surround her. Okay, so there's a real blackness here, um, clearly, of her um, attendance. Um, the other thing that Cecil B. DeMille did uh, in his movie um, is he has a scene in the movie, and I apologize, I couldn't find a clip of it to show you. But within the film, before Claudette Colbert appears, there's actually a scene in which this ro Roman woman asks these other women whether or not Cleopatra is black. And so he gives voice to that question. The response to that question is laughter. And so he invites this question that is clearly sort of percolating along through the 20th century, but he does it really just to ridicule it. And then Claudette Col Colbert appears and order is restored because it turns out that she's white and luminously white and, and all of that. But that seems to me just seems to be remarkable because you don't really get that in the Elizabeth Taylor film. 
By that time, the question is completely suppressed. But Cecil B. DeMille knows that question exists, and he wants to make fun of it um, by having that scene. So I think it's a really, really interesting scene in the film, and obviously intensely problematic. Um, okay, so this question then received full articulation in Newsweek uh, in 1991. And so you see this question is asked overtly on the cover of this major uh, news magazine, Was Cleopatra Black? And this really is coming um, in the, on the heels of Martin Bernal's Black Athena. So we can do a little bit more work to uncover this particular interest that Newsweek had. And I just want to uh, ask you to look at the the representation of Cleopatra. Uh, we'll come back and I'll tell you where that comes from. But it's a very distinct decision made by Newsweek to put that image on the cover. And you notice that Newsweek is also going to accessorize her in a very particular way, not with Egyptian sort of material culture, but with Africa. Um, and the colors here are um, insinuating questions about Afrocentrism. So she's um, positioned here uh, very, very distinctly on the cover. And since that, excuse me, magazine, I'd be happy to talk to you about how the question is handled inside, which is not well, um, but we can talk more about that. But since that time, there has certainly been, at least in mass media, an attempt to really um, respond to the question. I don't know that um, there's a particular interest in solving the question or thinking about it more than that. But all by way of saying that in recent portrayals of her, um, the casting has been done to do... Um, a much more racially diverse actress, or someone who is clearly not white. Maybe that's the easiest way to put it. Or, or doesn't seem to be white. That's a really important distinction. Um, so you have uh, this actress played Cleopatra in 1999. She's actually Chilean, which is a kind of interesting uh, another issue. And then you have uh, Lindsay Marshall, who is in that HBO series for Rome, um, who is uh, British. And I want to just point out here a little bit of what I was talking to you about before. You can see that... Um, the producers or the director of HBO's Rome did not allow her to appear sort of comfortably beautiful in ways that we've grown used to seeing Cleopatra. So this wig is very different from what she's shown with Elizabeth Taylor. It's, it's really, again, it's that idea of disorientation. And there's a number of scenes uh, where she looks like that. She is actually a very slight actress, so she doesn't have some of the... Um, side bits that uh, made Elizabeth Taylor so alluring as Cleopatra. So I think physically they really tried to disorient our expectations about Cleopatra. So to me it was a, an interesting choice. Um, okay, so um, we have all of these then very specific questions about Cleopatra. We can trace them to their foundations. But the question we haven't yet asked really is whether or not her skin color would have mattered to Cleopatra. So we have all of these questions. Is Cleopatra black? What would it mean to say that she's black? But we have to ask whether or not that's a question that would have meant anything to her, whether or not she would, in fact, have had an answer for that. And that really takes us then to the question of skin color in antiquity. And I've told you that in the 18th and 19th century, there's this um, attempt to link racial identity very concretely to skin color. And so beginning in the uh, 1970s, classicists start to ask a corollary question. Did black skin color matter in antiquity? And this is a very important classicist, Frank Snowden. And he was really honest about the fact, I'm asking this because it's such a pressing thing today. Black skin color matters so much today. Did it matter in antiquity? Um, and his conclusions were that it did not matter. That when he looked at artistic representations of um, black Africans, he uses particularly the term Ethiopian, which we can talk about if you want in question and answer. But he didn't find a categorical treatment of them as inferior. It doesn't matter that there weren't images that at times were negative, but there were also images that were extremely positive. There's an Ethiopian king and myth by the name of Memnon, who is shown extremely positively in um, Greek myth. Um, so he, he didn't discount skin color, maybe I'm more doing that, but, but he really said it doesn't have the same impact, that the Greeks and Romans did not discriminate according to skin color. And there was another scholar by the name of Lloyd Thompson that asked that very particular question, again, about the Romans, and found the same conclusions, that when we look at the way that Romans viewed uh, people with black skin color, we would never call it racial in the modern sense. And this, then, is that moment where um, the idea of um, race just dropped out of classicist vocabulary, because they thought, well, if if um, Greeks and Romans weren't discriminating against people with black skin color, then they weren't using racial thought. Okay, and we'll come back to that. Because what I want to ask is, is there a way that the Greeks were thinking racially beyond skin color? Um, so is there a way to think racially? And, and it should make sense to us, because if race 
how skin color is a particularly potent combination from the 18th and 19th century on, then what did it mean before that? So it's a kind of excavation. What would race look like before our 18th and 19th century, which has so made us so tunnel visioned about how to think about race. And it turns out that when you look at ancient texts, and, and I'll keep the premise that skin color doesn't matter, um, what you do find out is that the ancient Greeks and Romans did have a structure for organizing their perceptions of human variation. They also, in really important ways, linked it to a kind of science, but they linked it not to human biology, but to the environment. And so for the Greeks and Romans, human character and therefore human difference was determined by where you lived, by the climate. That is what produced you physically, but also mentally, emotionally. That's what uh, gave you the capacities that you have. Um, and part of how they did that is um, they divided the world into these climata, these zones, and then thought about what human life was like in each one of those zones. And, um, this is a longer question, I don't have to get too detailed, but part of what they were thinking about um, was what they could observe, which was the impact of the sun. So in hot climates, people they thought generalized were like this. In cool climates, people were like this. But in moderate climates, people were the best. That was how they used that racial thinking to um, assert a superiority. And what this means is that the people in the north were as different to the Greeks and Romans as people in the south. Okay, so you have not this black or white, but you have a, a, a center and peripheries. Um, and that center then was taken by them to be the most moderate, to um, produce then the most uh, virtuous or the most um, capable people. And in addition to that, um, if we want to kind of get more and more focused on Cleopatra, we could also think about the role of Egypt in ancient thought. So there's this larger way, oh, I'm going to blind myself, there's this larger way that they're thinking about um, racial difference, but then Egypt also had a very powerful place in Greek thought. Um, so we could see maybe how that provided certain contours. And there's been an excellent work um, by a scholar named Feroz Vesunia called The Gift of the Nile, Hellenizing Egypt from Aeschylus to Alexander. And he looks at the meaning of Egypt in Greek thought. It's a really, it's um, a wonderful book. And one of the things that we find when we look at that is the Egyptians are different from the Greek perspective. And in fact, Herodotus situates them as the opposite of Greeks. And he uses the analogy of the Nile. So the Egyptians as people are as opposite to the rest of the world as the Nile is to every other ri river. The Nile flows different from every other river. So that's what he was trying to make this, not exactly a causality, but an analogy. So the Egyptians are as different as uh, their natural environment. And Herodotus' treatment of Egypt, we're talking about it a little bit today at lunch, has been absolutely formative in all of these debates. So I'll stop there with him, but if you have any more questions, uh, we can talk more about his role. But I really then want to turn in the remainder of the lecture to talk a little bit more specifically about Cleopatra and how she enters what is now, I hope you're perceiving, a pretty complicated uh, terrain. So we can begin Cleopatra's story about... Um, a century after Herodotus, with the campaigns of Alexander the Great. So in 332 BCE, Alexander the Great conquered Egypt as part of his, master, uh, his massive campaigns. And following his death, Egypt was turned over to, this, uh, to his general Ptolemy, who established in Egypt what is called the Ptolemaic dynasty. So this is a dynasty that originally comes from a Macedonian, like Alexander. But Macedonian is not quite Greek. That's part of the complexity. Um, but in any event, um, this, we have the Ptolemaic dynasty ruling in Egypt for about 300 years. And Cleopatra is the last of the Ptolemies. Okay? So if we want to situate Cleopatra by her official family line, we would situate her in this dynasty of the Ptolemies. But, and this is a really interesting part of the Ptolemies and Alexander the Great himself, that from the time that they arrived in Egypt, these Greeks or Macedonians really attempted self-consciously to fold themselves into the earlier pharaonic tradition. So Alexander wanted to persuade people that he was not, in real terms, like the Persians, he was not some kind of foreign conqueror, but in fact, he was the return of a kind of pharaonic period. And there's all sorts of ways he did that. One of the ways he did it was he carved himself into what's called the Shrine of the Bark at Luxor. So there are all of these images with Alexander the Great. He has his own hieroglyphs. Um, and um, it's actually the largest corpus of Alexander images that survive today in this Egyptian temple. 
Um, and I will just give you an FYI, if you're thinking about your thousand year legacy, make sure that you don't put yourself next to fertility gods. Because when I went to visit Luxor, there were lines to take pictures with fertility god next to Alexander, and poor little Alexander was completely ignored. Um, so just as an FYI, be careful of the fertility gods. They tend to look really good in 20th century pictures. Okay. In any event, um, so Alexander founds the city of Alexandria on the coast of um, Egypt, and uh, it becomes a major cultural center during this period. It's a period of uh, great literary flourishing. Um, it's also a really important period in Jewish history, which I can talk more about in the question and answer period or not. You can see here there's a kind of attempt to maybe reconstruct what might be the Jewish quarters in Alexandria. So it really becomes a center of Jewish culture and life, of Greek culture and life. But the Ptolemies, even as they're living in this kind of colonial center, this colonial city, continue to have a kind of bilingualism. They continue to use a dual language. So they continue to use pharaonic art to decorate all of their architecture. And we can see a lot more of this in some of the underwater excavations now happening. This is a wonderful picture coming face to face with the Sphinx. So this whole portion of Alexandra is now under the sea, and people are trying to reconstruct what that area looked like during Cleopatra's lifetime. And they're finding, when they find these monuments, things that look very pharaonic. And it looks like the Ptolemies then, again, like Alexander, were trying to present themselves in a very um, traditional Egyptian vocabulary. And one of the things that I think is really helpful to remember that is if you've heard about the Rosetta Stone, um, and its importance in deciphering Egyptian hieroglyphics, the Rosetta Stone is actually a Ptolemaic text. And the reason why we can decipher um, the hieroglyphs is because it repeats the same message in three different languages, including Greek. So this is a, like the bi or trilingualism of the Ptolemies shown to you in full scale. So um, it's an inscription repeated, repeated, but because we know course, Greek and some of the languages, we can then reconstruct some of these individual hieroglyphs. Um, okay, so if you think about then this already, this attempt by the Ptolemies to be traditionally Egyptian, in some ways, in some ways they are still incredibly Greek. Uh, we come then to Cleopatra herself. She's actually Cleopatra the seventh. So if you want to bore your friends, you can make them use her number. Um, her name is a Greek name, meaning glory of the father. And she's born in about 68 or in 68 BC. I think that's pretty reliable. Um, I'm using here a coin to illustrate her. And I'll talk a little bit more in just a few minutes about why I did that, but also why it's slightly problematic. When we think about who Cleopatra was and how all of these ideas start to circulate around her, we could talk briefly about her own descent because this has been um, something that people have talked about um, in ways of opening questions about her racial identity. Um, the most important thing is one of Cleopatra's grandmothers, who was a mistress of one of the Ptolemies, has never been identified or conclusively identified. And so there's been arguments, including by one classical scholar, Alan Cameron, that it might be that this woman is actually Egyptian or Ethiopian. So there's this sort of gap in her family background. Now, whether or not at the end we're going to think of that as important is another question, but it's certainly something that you should know about. It's something that has been used to pry open this question of how we know who she is. Okay, Cleopatra, um, then once she jumps out of her carpet into the face of Julius Caesar, um, Caesar has arrived in Egypt to try to settle some things. There's a lot of motives that take him there that we talked about. But by the end of it, and after a very self-aggrandizing account of it, um, he is going to leave Cleopatra on the throne and uh, take, it looks like, a cruise up the Nile with her, um, which, in which he may have impregnated her, um, and he goes back to Rome. So uh, we're going to talk, and this is the, perhaps an image. This has come out of the water um, on the coast of Alexandria. This might be that little boy. It's really hard to know for sure. Um, he's certainly a royal child, but whether or not it's that son of Caesar um, is hard to know. Now, at this point in time, the Romans are very aware of who the Ptolemies are. And they refer to them as either Greek, if they are trying to be mean about them, or Macedonian, because um, Alexander the Great sort of has this um, affiliation with Macedonia, and that makes that a pretty good thing to be. So the Romans are sort of aware of the historical uh, reasons why the Ptolemies are in Egypt. And that's really important to remember. So we see them understanding completely who the Ptolemies are, how they get there. And they're going to forget that later. That's why I'm underlining it now. So Cleopatra herself, in 46 BCE, she comes to Rome. 
And sometimes in movies, that's where that one scene of Elizabeth Taylor comes in. She's arriving in Rome with this whole retinue. Um, but it's important to remember that, that if we think about her as a foreign threat, as she will become, she actually lived fairly harmoniously, harmoniously in Rome for maybe up to two years. Um, so she's within this state that is eventually going to demonize her um, like crazy. The one thing I will say about her residence in Rome is she stays in Caesar's estate in Trastevere, and Trastevere at that point in time was outside the city's pomerium. So she's actually staying outside the boundary of the city, which might have been about alleviating anxiety. So it might have been a slight pro a problem for her to be there. But I put this Cicero up um, in these roughly contemporary sources. The Romans are not referring to her as Egyptian. You know, I mean, Cicero finds her annoying. He doesn't find her exotic and threatening and all of these other things. He's just kind of, I think, mad about money or something. Um, but soon after all of this, we're going to see this relentless production of a Cleopatra who is no longer Ptolemaic, now she's Egyptian. Um, we're going to see set into motion this real campaign to try to bring out this Egyptianness to explain her as a kind of foreign threat. And um, you can go back to that um, painting of her poisoning prisoners. That's the kind of image now we're getting of Cleopatra. She's castrating, she's turning Antony into a woman, um, you know, she's uh, dissolving pearls in drink, and she's doing all of these things that were meant to portray her with this kind of excessive hunger. And this hunger was both sexual and material, and that was supposed to make her then the enemy to beat all enemies to the Romans. And what it really allowed is for Octavian, the Roman leader who was trying to take over after Caesar's assassination, to treat Cleopatra as his enemy. In other words, um, in what looks a lot more like a civil conflict with Mark Antony, he's allowed to present as a foreign war. And in fact, in one of the most telling gestures, um, Octavian never declares war against Mark Antony. He only officially declares war against Cleopatra. So he's converted Cleopatra into this monster, and he's made it look like the restoration of Rome after Caesar's assassination is going to be the restoration of this broader order a male order, a Roman order. So all of these ways that he's treating Cleopatra allow him to define a kind of Romanness that's going to emerge out of all of this conflict. Okay, and he uses then Egypt as this way of thinking, of, of, of essentializing what he finds, not only a gender difference, but this racial difference. So he's using Egyptian in a very, very particular way there. This idea of race as an act, not a fact. He's mobilizing this idea of Egyptian um, against her. So um, the Mark Antony and, and Cleopatra are going to meet Octavian and Actium in 31 BCE. This is the final moment of really, well, not quite the final moment, but we're getting to the end of the Roman civil wars. They flee, and that's another reason why Octavian will really uh, go after them and, and, and talk about femininity and cowardice. Um, and Octavian then chases them to Egypt, and this is just to show you the kind of terrain we're talking about. Here's Actium and here's Egypt. So they're going to flee and not really face Octavian decisively, and he's going to really hunt them down in Egypt. And that's where you start getting this images of her death in Alexandria. So from the time that, and, and one of the things that's really interesting about Cleopatra is that some people have interpreted her suicide as an act of defiance, that what she, didn't, what she really didn't want to happen was to be paraded at Rome, to be shown living in Octavian's triumph. So by committing suicide, she refuses to give him that. Although there's all sorts of stories that he made an effigy of her and paraded that in triumph anyway. But it's, a, it's an interesting way to look at that uh, moment. Okay, um, Octavian then from that point in time is going to treat the defeat of Cleopatra as really the foundational moment of his rise to power. And so he's going to use Actium itself, which turns out to be not such a great battle, but certainly ideologically a really important moment um, in all sorts of ways. And Actium is going to feature in all of his early narratives about how he came into power. He's also going to bring back various Egyptian tokens. Um, and one of them is this obelisk. And he's later going to attach uh, this inscription to it, which is a kind of lesson. Um, and there's all sorts of, this is who I am. I did all these, all these, all these things. And I also gave this obelisk as a gift to the sun after Egypt had been brought under the power of the Roman people. So it's sort of, sort of instruction to remind people where it all began. It began when I conquered Egypt, when I brought it um, under control. So if Egypt is teaching the Roman audience about Roman conquest, then I want to just take a step back and think about um, 
Cleopatra teaching something different, not as teaching us Roman power, but teaching us something maybe uh, more about race itself. So um, I've hinted at a number of things um, already that race um, for Cleopatra is um, a work in progress. Um, and when I'm talking in this way, I'm talking mainly about a racial category that is how the Romans racialize her. Okay, so that's a work in progress. She is Ptolemaic until it's no longer convenient for her to be Ptolemaic, and then she's Egyptian. And boy, when I say she's Egyptian, you'll understand now why I have to kill her. Okay, so it's mobilized in very specific circumstances. Um, and so you can see that idea that it's a process, one that also allows Octavian to consolidate masculine or Roman identity as something that is both Roman as opposed to Egyptian, but also male as opposed to female. But I want to really flip that on its head and think not about racial categories, how the Romans racialize Cleopatra, but to see if we can try to, and this is a huge question, recover her own racial agency. So if we think not what they saw her as, but what she performed as, would we find out something different? And it turns out that at least in the artwork that survives, and I'm focusing on that, that the artwork suggests that Cleopatra, like most of the Ptolemies, had a public, at least, presentation of herself that, to use modern terminology, we would call hybrid. That is, she's going to go back and forth between Greek and Egyptian. And she seems to do it pretty effortlessly. It doesn't seem to be a kind of conceptual problem. Um, and she's going to do really important things on the Egyptian side that shouldn't be underestimated. One is that, at least, it's told that she's the first Ptolemy to learn Egyptian. She actually also speaks Ethiopian, which is a kind of interesting idea. Um, she's also depicted worshiping the Egyptian goddess Isis. So if race involves also a kind of cultural performance, she is performing Egyptian culture, um, it looks like, in many contexts. And we can see this really in the artwork, and that's really what I've been asking you to think about as a visual vocabulary. And so both of these have been identified as Cleopatra. So this is Cleopatra in the guise of a Greek um, girl, I guess, a Greek young maiden. She's got her little headband on. Um, but this has also been identified as Cleopatra. Um, something is much more legible, not within a Greek portrait tradition, but within an Egyptian tradition of portraiture. And I do just want to say one thing about portraiture, which is um, keep an asterisk next to it, because portraiture is really difficult to identify, and it relies on a lot of preconceptions. This looks like Cleopatra. It must have been Cleopatra. Um, and so often people turn to evidence like coins. And coins are um, more reliable in the sense that they often label their figures by name. So when Cleopatra appears on a coin, we know that it is her um, representation on the coin. What's interesting about the coinage of Cleopatra, I think Steve, you and I were talking about this on the phone, is it tends to show her as surprisingly, I don't know what the word is to use here, unattractive in modern terms. So if you're approaching Cleopatra and think that she should be gorgeous, like Elizabeth Taylor, these coins from a modern aesthetic do not make her look that way. And what I think is a really interesting circular logic, some people think that they are more authoritative because they make her look so bad. And so the argument is, well, they must be realistic. Why would they show her like that if she didn't really look like that? Um, but it could be a poor portrait, right? I mean, it could be an artist just doesn't work very well in coinage. Um, but in any event, these are Cleopatra on coins. And so you can think about what the circulation of coins is, why it might have been more um, effective for her to use a, a more Greek portrait there. And incidentally, this is probably how they got, got that portrait. I don't know the exact history of it, but how they identified that other portrait. They looked at this and thought, oh, okay, well, her... Um, standard iconography, she looks like this, this must be her portrait. But when Cleopatra had the opportunity to put up a monument of her own, this is what she put up. Okay, so she circulates coins, or coins are circulated with her looking like a Greek woman, but this is Cleopatra. And this is Cleopatra, represented at the Temple of Hathor at Dendera, and presumably she, she doesn't design it, she's not an artist, but had full agency over this mode of representation, was extremely comfortable being shown like that. Um, and Remember that this is, or I should say, if you didn't catch it, this is the head that Newsweek chose. So Newsweek could have chosen a coin. They could have chosen that Greek sculpture. This is what they chose. This is actually her son, um, Caesarian, which is a really great um, gesture for her to remind everybody that she has this child of Caesar. So it's an incredibly complicated um, gesture that she's doing here. But there's no question that she's showing herself within a pharaonic tradition here, communicating to an Egyptian audience the power that she holds, which is as a type of pharaoh.
Um, and this I just want to kind of mention briefly. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this. Um, this is a um, reconstruction of what Cleopatra actually looked like. What I find most problematic about it is it's evidently based on her ancient images. So I have no idea if you take you know, the average of some of these images. I don't know how you get to this from all of those images. So I don't know what this reconstruction is based on, but you can see that there's a very particular point that is trying to be made here. Um, and um, it's actually the case that uh, we might be able to approximate what Cleopatra looked like, not um, unless we dig up her body, which is one type of project, which I don't think is ever going to happen. Um, but I'm not sure that would be the most convincing, because we really, if we want to understand her racially, we have to know what she made of her body and what other people made of it. So even if we had her DNA, I'm not sure what it would tell us about her in her own context. It might tell us something that we would want to know um, about her today. This Again, this question of blackness and whiteness, which is extremely important today, but um, I think less important, important to her herself. And one of the things I really want to emphasize is when we look at Cleopatra, and this is partially what I've been encouraging you to do for the last uh, 45 minutes or so, um, we're really reducing her to um, a kind of static body. We're looking at her. And in fact, it looks like that she performed her identity in motion. And so we might want to think about what that motion was. And in fact, Plutarch, when he talks about her, makes a point of saying that her attractions were not that she was beautiful, this is what Plutarch says, but that she had a facility with conversation, that she knew so many languages. So there's this charm and allure that he understands in a three-dimensional body, not just in looking on her. The languages that she spoke, he records. Um, and we can find a little bit, maybe a different look at her, more in motion, by something that's um, been fascinating in recent years. I apologize, that's not the most serious portrayal. But this might be Cleopatra's handwriting. And if this is Cleopatra's handwriting, I think it's, it's more an indication of what she does and how we might try to reconstruct that. Um, this is just um, a word at the bottom of a petition. And so the real debate is whether or not she wrote it herself. So um, presumably a scribe was reading to her, can so-and-so have a tax break? And this word just means, yes, let them have it, or you know, let it be so. But whether or not she wrote it or a scribe wrote it, that's the big question. But it's a petition that would have been presented to her, we know from its date, and presumably she's the one making the decision. So the tantalizing thing is simply whether or not she bothered to write it, or someone was just saying, you know, what do you think, yes, what do you think, yes. But it's a different handwriting from the petition, and that's what the kind of argument rests on. Okay, so uh, we're coming now... Um, maybe as a relief to uh, near the end of the talk. Um, and so what I really want to, to problematize as we're leaving this example is a certain number of things. This question of looking at her versus performing, the difference between racial categories and what it is that she might have understood as her racial identity. Um, but one of the things I really want to underline is that most of the evidence about her comes from the Romans. And so we're looking through a very particular gaze. Um, but I'm not suggesting that we throw that out. I'm just saying that we resist its values. So there are many classicists, and I've been in rooms where they've talked like this, in which um, when the question comes out about Cleopatra being Egyptian, they consider it insulting to her. Um, you know, no, 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 she wasn't Egyptian. Come on, she was Greek. I don't really consider it an insult to ask that question because I actually think Cleopatra would be quite comfortable with the idea that she's Egyptian. However, I believe that she also would be comfortable with the idea that she's Greek. And I don't think that she would find those two things mutually exclusive. So we want to avoid some of the values that underline some of these questions. Um, and that's really why I say I think these questions are really important to circulate. I think we can formulate better responses to them. But the heart of it is really thinking about, and this is what Dr. Balch was thinking about in his introduction, the uh, world of classical antiquity, in particular among Western civilization, is so infused in our modern popular culture. We think about what the ancient Greeks and Romans did a lot to think about who we are and what it is we do. And the question that we really have to think about is how we translate some of their ideas without reinforcing them, without simplifying them, without misrepresenting them. So, in fact, I don't... You know, this, a friend of mine loves it when I say this, but I would rather have a Cleopatra who's portrayed as black than I would as white. It doesn't mean I think that she historically had black skin color. I don't know what skin color she had, but it's clear that from the Roman perspective, she was positioned as an other. 
and aggressively as an other. And if that's how it's legible to a modern audience, that's how it's legible. However, it's dangerous because then we are in this loop where we actually think that the skin color meant the same thing. So it's a really complicated question. How do we show ancient ideology in a way that doesn't distort it, that doesn't sort of unconsciously reproduce it, um, but that we can lead to better conversations? And the example that I want to end with is one that maybe, oops, sorry, this is Cleopatra, um, is um, this example of 300. Because this, let me do it this way, this and this comes from that. This is an ancient Greek vase showing the Greeks fighting the Persians. This is how this difference is translated in modern film. And so we have to think really critically about that. What is the work in particular that's happening with the Persian? Why is he bald? Why is he draped in jewelry? Why is he sexually ambiguous? If you've seen this, you know that that's key to his representation. Um, why does a Greek have fantastic abs? That's my question. Um, and, and if we don't really think about that, then we get something like this, which will actually make us think about it. And that's, um, this was a protest um, against the movie 300, precisely because of its representation of Persians. And I think that I will stop there. So thank you all very much.